Aloha everyone and welcome to another Tinkers Academy video and this video is special. We're going to talk about the science of quantum energy and this is a Tinker Chat with Ian Mitchell and Philip von Holzendorf. So I just wanted to let you guys know uh, if you don't know who these gentlemen are, uh, Ian Mitchell is the owner operator of Wizard Scientist. He's an acclaimed scientist, uh, you know, pr uh, most recently and currently in the C60 and uh, world, multiple patents to his name and he's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, we've also got Philip von Holzendorf uh, Felling, uh, who's the owner operator of Layla Quantum Tech. And so, and he is uh, really an expert in the area of energy work, uh, clairvoyance, uh, and he's actually uh, an actual shaman. So, what's really cool about this discussion today is we're going to be talking about the science of quantum energy. We have a scientist, we have a shaman, and then I'll be facilitating the discussion with my perspectives as well. So, hey, gentlemen, good morning, and, and thanks for joining. How are you hey, doing Kay. today? Happy to be here. All right. This is hey, gonna... Kay, thanks for the invite. I think, you know, yeah, right. really. Oh, thanks hey, I, think, uh, I think the next time we speak, guys, um, Philip, I, I am going to take the role of shaman, and you you can go for scientists. I think it might uh, it might be kind of interesting <laughs> to see to see what each of us comes up with yeah. from the perspective of a different domain. Oh, I would I'll be the I'll be the uh, physicist that just criticizes everything you both say. Uh, <laughs> I got I got to you know it's really funny actually I was going through all these different videos to pull content for just you know talking points, and I ran across one where um, I think it was um, Deepak Chopra was talking at a convention and a physicist came on, you know, they, they stand up and get the mic. And so he, so the physicist and Deepak are trying to, you know, are talking to each other. And, and so, uh, so the guy goes, you know, I don't understand. You know, he goes, I understand. Well, this is his quote when Deepak was trying to explain quantum or uh, basically biofield and quantum. And, and he just, and the guy looks at him, this, this, this PhD guy goes, looks right at Deepak and goes, you know, I know what all those words mean individually, but I don't get what you're saying <laughs> the way you're putting them together. <laughs> and, and it's really funny. And, and then so Deepak goes and actually says, you know, well, uh, let's, you know, goes, well, lots of people will call this woo woo, but that's a cop out. You know, just it's like, you know, you just you're just basically labeling it and throwing it off to the side. But, you know, it's not woo woo. And I think that's the first thing I want to say uh, is that the idea of quantum energy, as we are going to define it today, uh, is not woo woo. So. Hey, let's jump in. But yeah, definitely, I want. I definitely would love to hear uh, you defend shamanism, and then uh, Philip defend science. That would <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first point of the discussion uh, that I want uh, I get you know get you guys to to kind of comment on is the idea here, and this is the first thing anybody should understand about this topic is that there's no definition with the words that we're using. In other words, there's no language. I cannot find a language that encapsulates the concepts of what we're, of what we're talking about and what anyone is talking about in this subject matter. And, and so here's like, here's the literally, the definition of quantum is, you know, is this where you can see on the screen, I won't read it, but the concept is that, hey, the definition of quantum and the actual definition by, you know, Webster's or whomever, uh, of, of energy, none of these things apply to the concepts that we're describing. And it's only the fact that we're, you know, we're using these words for the lack of words to use. I mean, would you guys agree with that? 100%. That's, that's the problem with this is in terms of conveying it to someone, you're dealing with things that are subtle. And the degree of subtlety is something by, by virtue of the kind of topics that we're looking at uh, for the purposes of, say, like Leela Quantum Tech. When I look at that, it, it is, it's daunting because the vernacular doesn't exist. You're, you're trying to, I mean, obviously the vernacular exists for quanta and, and descriptions of what that is, but it, it's really not appropriate because when you're trying to look at something from the standpoint of, okay, that's great. What's the level of abstraction beyond that? Well, then you get to a place where things really do, you know, and, and I agree woo-woo is a cop-out because as a scientist, you're supposed to go where there is a lack of understanding and try and shine a light on it. Um, but it is, yeah, I, I have no words for a lot of the things. And that's why I, I do a lot of these things via analogy is we can we can understand in principle, but there, there are just simply some things that are beyond the component of 
uh, doing it as a, a very definable test. Like there's literally not a human alive probably that doesn't understand the concept of love in some form or fashion, but you know, show me the meter that's going to gauge that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. Yes. So, you know, uh, and, then and, and if you guys well, actually have a line on a levometer, uh, let me know where I can buy one. <laughs> you know? uh, okay. I'll, I'll work on that one. So Philip, you know, <laughs> and, one of the things I was thinking about when it comes to language and I, I yeah, I totally agree. I, and, but you know this whole thing about language, and 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 one of the thoughts that popped in my head last night when I was putting this deck together was, all right, here's the definitions. None of it applies. There's no words for this. But then I also know for a fact, right, that when Europeans uh, dominated or spread out across the planet and dominated all the indigenous cultures, they wiped out their cultures and language and religious practices, and would dominating uh, of all of that with their own. And I'm wondering because of your shamanic background, if there exists words prior to the domination of the european culture right but to, uh, for the first nations people and the indigenous populations are there words in that realm that that really kind of define what this is is there like is there a better language that we could be using instead of english I'm well i mean curiosity. i i think i i think in sanskrit for example um, an ancient language there's there's a lot of wisdom and understanding in it, so I, I think that's a that's a pretty good language to look at. And there's also some you know scriptures in in that language that are you know interesting to look at from that standpoint. But I would 100% agree also with what Ian said. Is a deep truth of creation just cannot be described with words. The the infinite yeah. basically is what we cannot describe we can we can try and we can get near that but it it's not a concept that you or it's it, that truth cannot be explained with words in a way that everybody understands it right if it was so easy then you could just write a few sentences and everybody would immediately get it but it's something you actually need to experience so we're always in this stretch position in a way between okay what do we experience and and how do we describe it and that's kind of the trick here also because i mean i think so many people now understand that that exists that there's more than just this physical material world that we're seeing with our own eyes right living in the in these extra dimensions of space and time moving from spot a to spot b and and then you know time moves as we move along that is something that doesn't exist in the in the truth behind it if you will yeah. but how do you explain it so it is right. it is very difficult and i think what we're doing today is we're going to try to get closer to it and hopefully people can relate to that um as we're trying to do that from a few different angles <laughs> No, that, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, even if you pull back, I mean, because a lot of people approach this topic with trepidation because, you know, it's the idea of spirituality or something larger than ourselves. And, and that, I think, just inherently makes people proceed with caution. If you say the same thing about something that we've all done, you, you can understand how it's very difficult to convey even the most simple things uh, linguistically without the actual first-hand experience, you know, eating chocolate cake. You can write and read about eating chocolate cake all day long, but it's kind of a, it's an abstraction without actually really an experiential component. You're left dry. It doesn't mean much. You know, you can say, oh, then you move your jaws and your tongue moves through a semi-viscous, you know, solid at this percentage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all just descriptive terms, but really when you eat the chocolate cake, you understand it firsthand. And that's something that we take for granted every day, a little a simple item. When you start talking about something like this, like what is the substrate of reality? What, what transpires to actually make things manifest in a physical level? That's when I think you, you get met with a lot of fear about it. But the same thing applies just across all domains, really. It's about the experience. You, you have to experience it you know, I mean, it, it, truly with quantum, um, the experience is one of the most critical components because it actually changes changes the output of the entire thing. Yeah, there, yep. Yep, yep, yep. I think uh, 
side note for uh, for all you folks out there that you know if you really are having a hard time wrapping your head around it just know that uh, we're going to use the words quantum energy in a capacity that's not in the western uh you know uh you know society's definitions and it's going to be kind of what we're going to try to do today is actually define that uh for everyone what we mean by when we use the term quantum energy and not and not in a woo sense but actual in in a real sense uh, but just keep in mind that the current definitions don't apply so yeah thanks gentlemen and so now the second concept that i want to throw at you is that you know for the last i don't know forever uh, I've been trying to explain stuff like this to people because I've been involved in bioelectrical magnetics. And so when I talk like the work of Wilhelm Reich and you know, his, I, his discovery, well, he what not discovery, but, uh, you know, of Oregon. And then, of course, being a Qigong guy, uh, you know, I've been really involved with Qi and, and, you know, martial arts. And, and then, of course, prana and mana. But, you know, these are all the words that you hear come up when people talk about, you know, this etheric energy. Uh, but even in these terminologies, it doesn't, I mean, is there is no one word. I mean, have you guys even come close to finding any one of these kinds of concepts, even being remotely close to it? Um, yeah, actually, on, on the list here, but, but again, um, looking at these, yeah, I, some of these things are good approximations, but they're, they're only approximations within one segment. They don't, each of these things mean something differently. And Having had experiences and and done you know experiments with some of them, um, I mean like zero point energy that's pretty easy. You can just look at something when it's at absolute zero or, or an approximation thereof, and you note that things are still moving. Well, there there you go. That's that's a legit and testable phenomenon. Um, scalar energy less so. Uh, orgone less so. Chi and key. Anybody who's ever done a bit of martial arts or been around somebody who's um, you know a a practitioner of qigong unless you're absolutely living in a bubble you can feel the actual impact of that on your physiology uh, same thing with with prana um, personally i really haven't <laughs> dealt with mana but you know it, those things are again the reason they have validity to me is because they're experiential and once you do it unless you want to stick your head in the sand and be kind of the the ostrich scientist you have to realize that there are things that you're going to experience that we just don't have clinically descriptive words or academically descriptive words for. Um, you know, zero point energy is a good one because you can verify that. You know, we know it exists. Uh, spooky action at a distance. We know that happens because we were able to test things uh, three years ago. A Japanese research team tested quantum entanglement and was able to verify that the, the effects were happening at uh, 10,000 times faster than the speed of light. And that's that's pretty profound. You know, that's uh, by common thought in the sciences that wasn't supposed to happen, but it but it obviously did. Um, so, you know, the doorway is there. It's just a matter of can you look through it? So, yeah, these terms, they're impactful. But to me, they're all subtle flavors of it because, right. you know, my interpretation of scalar is differently than orgone because uh, they just are. And, you know, my experience with key is different than my experience with prana. Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, I think that closer everybody is to like, you know, like dabbling, like you just said, you had a really good point. These are all flavors. And I think to understand what we mean by quantum energy is to understand that these words all touch it. They're all different flavors of it, but they're not they're not exactly what it is, but they all are very close. And then so Philip, from like from your background, you know, I mean, you are actually I think you you teach kundalini uh yoga and all these different kinds of things and so you're super close to this is anything along those lines um like what would you say is the closest to quantum the word quantum energy as we're trying to use it uh in in that realm yep. for you i mean what would you say is the closest thing to it it's a great question and and one thing i tell people is that you know we breathe air here on earth to to be alive we drink water so that we can function and then you know while for some people on earth is actually not needed to eat food you know most people eat food and also need to eat food in order to be alive but that's what most people talk about and people forget that we actually also need a source of energy to actually function because without that energy we wouldn't exist either so it is absolutely vital and one could argue that's 
more important than food. And so you can do martial arts, yoga, various practices of yoga, um, tai chi, etc., in order to increase your life force energy within you. The same actually with prana does the very same thing. So Kundalini actually includes a lot of breath work and it's absolutely fantastic. And you can increase the life force energy within you knowingly and you, you can feel it while you're doing it already that you're you're pumping yourself up basically with that energy and you have more energy available now the technology that we've created together with roman actually provides that energy as well without you having to do these things doesn't mean it's not beneficial to also do yoga. Actually, I think it's amazing if you do it in addition and you get way further. But there's a source of that energy that you can leverage to increase your life force energy. So it's sort of a source energy that we need to exist and that helps us to be physically in good shape and also helps our energetic system that's what i would say to this yeah no I, I i agree i agree with both of you i think my own personal experience is uh practicing qigong and and, and feeling something that's outside of me and also inside it just you feel it you know you're right Ian. i mean i think that's the thing we should make it like uh, mandatory classes for college students to have to explore these realms because that way they could balance their academia with I would say reality. This is, you know, the true reality of our existence, because if you feel it, there's no denying it anymore. I mean, to sit there and move very slowly and then break out into a sweat and just be like wiped out uh, or charged up, actually, uh, physically, you know, uh, challenged. But I mean, that Qigong is an amazing practice because <laughs> you, you could, there's this energy that comes into you, right? And then the same thing with and then the thing about scale, I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Jerry Tennant, but he's coming out with a new book where he's uh, kind of basically going to be talking about how scalar energy is the energy of our DNA um, and the intercellular uh, energy that kind of puts pulls it all together. In addition to his healing with voltage work, he's doing research on the idea of scalar, and that's his, that's his theory. So his new book's coming out uh, all about scalar as it relates to biochemical and, and healing with voltage uh, kind of work. So that's, I'm looking forward to reading that book. Uh, so, you know, so all of these different energies, obviously they all tie together to help on the definition of what quantum energy is. So next talking point I want to throw at you guys, and this is to everybody out there. And, you know, a lot of folks that maybe didn't pay attention to science in school, but, but the, the, the another talking point that we want to throw out uh, in our definition or discussing of the science of quantum energy is the idea that there is this energy and 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 for folks that deny that there's an energy what i this is my talking point that i would like to or maybe they don't understand it but the point i want to make and and gentlemen if you could chime in is that from a very very down to the atomic level we know scientists know that and you know that we have basic electrons neutrons protons and there's a nucleus of an atom and there's electrons that are flying around as a diagram depicts and there's this movement and in order to have movement, you have to have energy. And so there's the concept that here, first of all, there's a space between all of these different particles. And so there's a concept here like, okay, is anything truly solid? If even down to the, our atomic structure of our bodies, there's space in between. So there's space between everything. So, you know, there's a whole concept there about being solid. But the point I'm trying to make is about energy. There's energy that's moving all of these particles around. And with movement, comes frequency down to the very and this is where we talk about quantum quantum is this uh, you know the smallest part particle you could find and even within this nucleus there's smaller and smaller and smaller particles and then when you look at the galactic you know you look at the universe you see that same idea of not only movement but you can see where it's everything still spinning but there's also movement and where is that movement and how is that movement you know people can call it gravity but that's not you know, that gravity doesn't truly play if you get into the deep end of the pool here. But the idea, though, is that the galaxy, everything's moving. Every single thing down to the tiniest atomic, subatomic particle is moving all the way up to entire galaxies and everything floating around in the universe is moving. And what causes movement? That energy. 
So, gentlemen, would you think that, quote, that energy kind of falls into the definition of quantum energy? Yes, I will. I will go on record as saying, yes, it does. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that even when, by calculations, molecular motion should cease and subatomic motion should cease at absolute zero, it doesn't. Um, because it, it, it has the appearance, at least in my, in my studies, um, it has the appearance that all motion in the universe is spiral in nature. Um, both on the subatomic and the, you know, the cosmic scales and intergalactic scales, everything seems to be moving in a, in a sort of spiral motion. And personally, um, my, my money is on the concept that the inherent power that keeps all of these things moving is that it's something that's, you know, a little indefinable that's beyond, beyond the level of, um, where, where we're at technologically. I would also say that I think in time, we'll probably approximate it more closely, but I, I really, again, I, I really don't know that we'll ever actually be able to uh, look at it perfectly. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the story Flatlanders. Have you guys ever heard heard that? It's a little short story, but it's basically, it's um, a sphere, a three-dimensional sphere, finds its way into a two-dimensional land. And it's trying to explain to the two-dimensional creatures uh, what it is. And they can't experience it in its own nature of three dimensions. So they can only understand it by abstractions based on their perception of reality. So, in, And similarly, when we are a subset of something, I think we can come up with terminology and try and get a good grasp of it based on you know, looking at things and coming up with analogies to, to understand conceptually. But I don't think uh, shy of having a direct interaction and a direct experience of something like that, I don't think you'll ever peg it down. Yeah. I think that's a, an yeah. amazing example, actually, because that's that's exactly the situation that we're as, as humans in, right? Uh, because we, we can observe easily, you know, the the dimensions that we witness here in the physical world, right? It's three dimensional for us. And that's, that's very easy. And, and everybody gets to observe that, but we're way more than just that. And that goes really into higher dimensions. And it's, if you're, if, if you, if you don't have a conscious view or a conscious experience of those dimensions beyond you're you're going to have a very hard time in understanding that no matter how it is explained now if, if your intention is to understand that and maybe you're working on becoming more transparent and getting there through meditation other practices through you know accumulating knowledge etc then you will start to understand that concept but you will never fully understand until you are actually consciously experiencing some of these things. So one, one thing I might interject there, Philip, with regard to your particular technology that you and Roman have, and this is certainly not a, not a plug for it, but it's just, it's my own unabridged experience with this. Um, and, you know, just I'll tell you what I've experienced. Uh, one of the guys that works for me um, in in playing with this, you know, I have the Geiger counters, and we've tested tested the block for radiation. Can't find any gamma emissions or anything, you know, no beta or anything like that. Um, magnetically, it doesn't seem to do anything. Electrically, it's static, other than just maybe the spattering of things that would come about from interaction with ions in the air. Um, but I can tell you, matter of factly, the the one fellow in the lab who has a very pronounced histamine reaction. Um, he doesn't have a histamine reaction to foods that he normally does if we put them in the block, which I, uh -huh. I got to tell you, from, from the standpoint of just um, seeing something that's repeatable over and over without really being able to put the terminology around it, it does flummox me a little bit because I can see it, I can repeat it, I can get the same data over and over but I genuinely have no terminology that I can wrap around it and say, it is this. <laughs> and and that, that's part of the reason I, I'm so open to doing these sorts of things is because when you're able to repeat the experiment and get the same result every single time, there's something of note there, 
we just haven't figured out what it is. And unfortunately, I, I do really believe that we may never be able to peg an it down on this. We might just be able to say, oh, it's this thing that exists outside of our particular confines of you know three dimensions and the arrow of time moving in one direction. No, oh, yeah, that's that's amazing. But you know, you're right. You're right. Uh, there's that causality, right? That, that, but you know, so so the definition of quantum energy, as as we are trying to define, has multiple flavors, and this molecular and galactic energy is just one of the flavors. But it's not the energy we're talking about. It's just it's part of it. I think it's kind of like this uh, framework. I guess is the best word for it. Uh, I'd like to throw another talking point at you guys. It's a four-minute uh, video by Bruce Limpton. And in all of my, like, you know, just kind of like my background search for content for our discussion, I found this video to be just an amazing because he brings up a metaphor of a television <laughs> that truly defines what, you know, like uh, that, that, first of all, that the energy, it's another definition of energy. Um, but it's like a, a, a definition that I'll let him explain. I to interpret it as consciousness. But let's go ahead and, if you don't mind, let me go ahead and play that for you guys. And then I'd love to hear your 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 interpretation and your feedback on that. So here we go. Did you ever wonder if there's anything more to a human than this physical body that we have? Well, it's real interesting because if we go back in history, they talk about something called spirit and energy and an invisible force that seems to be controlling who and what we really are. Quantum physics emphasizes that the universe is not really split into two realms, a material realm and an energetic realm. Quantum physics reveals that everything is made out of energy. What we perceive as matter is actually an illusion of energy and light, that there is nothing physical. Now, what do you mean? I say, well, first of all, a very simple fact. When physicists started to take the atom apart, and find there were things inside, such as protons, neutrons, and electrons. Then they say, yeah, but what are those things made out of? Then they got down to smaller things like quarks. And then I say, yeah, but what were they made out of? And ultimately, what physicists recognized was at the fundamental core of an atom, there is nothing material at all. It's an energy vortex. It's a powerful energy field. And that all atoms are these energy fields. And the significance about that is, well, atoms make up humans. And so by definition, we perceive ourselves as physical structures, but according to quantum physics, we're energy vortices. Imagine the cell as a television set, and that the environmental signal, like a broadcast, is being picked up by the antennas on that television set. And therefore, the cell responds to that broadcast. Well, guess what? Everyone has a different set of antennas, so by definition, everyone is receiving a different broadcast field. Field, yeah, that's what physicists refer to as the energy in which we live. So all of us are in a field, but each one of us actually receives a very precise and specific part of that field different than everybody else. No two people share the same self-receptors. That's why we just can't exchange cells, organs, and tissues with each other. Now comes an interesting part. If the cell is like a television receiving a broadcast, then consider this. What happens if you're watching your TV and it breaks? We say the TV's dead. I go, yeah. But now the question is this. Yes, the TV just died, but is the broadcast still there that I was watching? The answer, of course, it's still there. The television's gone. The broadcast is present. I say, how would you know? Well, one way of knowing, get another TV set, plug it in, turn it on and tune it to the right station and the show is back on air. Well, this would apply directly to humans as well. I have an identity due to a set of receptors receiving an environmental signal. If I die, I have no more reception and therefore my broadcast exists, but there's no TV to express it. If an embryo shows up in the future with the same set of self receptors that I have, well then guess what? I'm back online in a different TV. Does it have to be a male or female TV? Nope, that's the TV. Well, how about, is it black, white, brown, red, yellow? Nope, that's the TV. That's not who you are. You are the broadcast. Lastly, it's important to note that the character that you express in this life is actually sent back to your source because your brain is not keeping your consciousness in your head because magnetoencephalographs Unlike electroencephalographs, magnetoencephalographs read your brain function, but the probes don't even touch your head. 
a very important concept right here. Your thoughts are not contained in your head. They're broadcast into the field. And as Einstein emphasized, the field is the sole governing agency of the particle matter. And then we put all of this together and says, your biology is an expression of this matter, but it's actually shaped by the field, a field that exists whether you're here or not. And then all of a sudden, the ancient story of spirituality now conforms to the modern day science of quantum physics. You're a field, you're a spirit, you're more than this. And when you understand that, it is the first step towards your personal empowerment. What do you guys think of that one? I'm inclined to clap. <laughs> that was, that was fantastic. Yeah. Isn't that one Very of the well said. best exam or best explanations of, of energy or like in my mind, the quantum energy, you know, the way we're using those words, and I still hate the words because they don't mean what they mean, but just the way we're using it, I think that's a perfect example. It's everything is energy, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, isn't it? It's just so what do you think? I mean, I mean, Philip, well, I'll, I'll jump in with something yeah. that comes to mind. Um, one thing is, I'm sure both of you guys are familiar with dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we, we produce DMT in our brain uh, via pineal excretion and, and a transformation from melatonin. So, but we, we produce DMT. Um, but when you take pure DMT, most people have an experience that's similar. People see the same sorts of things routinely. And the interesting thing about DMT is that it intercalates into your DNA, right? And as we know from De Broglie's handy dandy equations in 1920 to four, um, anytime you change the mass of something, like you change its wavelength, right? Or it's tuning. And so you, you adjust, to follow Lipton's uh, analogy there, you, you, uh, you adjust the tuning on the TV. So you're able to tune into things that you wouldn't normally be able to see because and I really think that the reason for that is if I were designing a universe, I would want to be very efficient and I certainly wouldn't waste anything. And, and seemingly the easiest way to do that is to overlap a whole host of realities in a planar fashion and just separate them by very small nudges and frequency, the same way that you would do with three phase electricity, right? Mm -hmm. You have the phases running counter to one another. And so they don't impact one another. They all exist, but they don't interact in the same way because they're slightly out of phase. And I think that the same thing happens with consciousness, right? Our consciousness is phased in and tuned in for a particular reality. And some things like shamanic experiences, and feel, feel free to correct me if I'm speaking out of turn, but um, from my own experience and my own research, when people are experiencing altered states, I think they're subtly adjusting their tuning so that they're able to perceive from uh, a source that's far larger than they normally can. And the other thing that's probably the, the one point of this that I personally would like to drive home is if you think there's any validity to that, uh, and, I, and I personally do, the idea that your thoughts don't occur in your head doesn't shock me because nature is very efficient. It's certainly going to figure out how to store things on the cloud in lieu of storing things on a body because it's not subject to the same uh, processes that can degrade the signal. Uh, that being said, if we're all connected, uh, I would just like to point out, be nice, be kind, uh, because those waves propagate throughout the whole of reality. So whatever interaction you have on a small scale, uh, that'll impact everybody everywhere. So just as a quick aside. No, it's Philip. Absolutely. Yeah, f fantastic. And that's uh, also a great explanation, Ian. So I can just second that um, in terms of the, the tuning. And that's what you find, for example, if we look at someone like, like Roman, who can tune into a lot more breadth and frequencies than the normal human being, right? Where that spectrum may be very, very narrow, his is extremely broad uh, on, on multiple levels. And yeah, so there are things that some people just can't observe because they're just not there yet, and other people can. So 
yeah, I can absolutely 100% agree with everything that I just said. Cool. So I, I want to add one more talking point and then kind of just do a general summary of just of just trying to define the phrase quantum energy. And then that is a quote by Einstein. And uh, it's in German. So, uh, Philip, let me know if or actually, since you've been practicing German rap, maybe I and you could kind of correct me if I pronounce it, <laughs> if I pronounce it correctly. So I, I've been practicing. So Spulkoff von Werkon. Is that is that is that close? Spukhafte Fernwirkung. Fernwirkung. That, that's okay. Fernwirkung. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole idea, though, and for you guys at home, is that uh, Einstein once wrote a letter uh, to a friend of his, and he just basically said, I cannot seriously believe in it. And he was talking about the statistical approach to quantum mechanics. Okay. And he said, I cannot seriously believe in it because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that physics should represent a reality in time and space free from free from spooky action at a difference, which actually translated was this uh, spoon coffin free, free work on, uh, <laughs> which at the time meant spooky or ghostly. So there's really, uh, there's no, you know, the, so the spooky, uh, the, the term spooky didn't really apply back then. It was this other word that was used again here. We're talking about language, right? But what this point makes is that Einstein said that the energy of our reality is independent of space and time. That there's something else there, but it's independent of space and time. We know that it's broadcasted. So if it's broadcasted and it exists because we wouldn't exist without it um, and it's free from space and time, then what the whole point of my trying to make a definition of, the, of our use of quantum energy, and if you've noticed by now, uh, is that I'm trying to define it or help people understand it um, by explaining what it is not <laughs> and also explaining what it might be. Uh, but to actually give you words for it is not possible. But I just wanted to share all the different concepts of the words. So, I mean, uh, you know, I and you'd mentioned spooky at a distance before and that scientists have actually measured it. Right. So, yeah, they have. They yeah. clocked it a few years ago and it was, you know, happening at I, if memory serves. And I'm pretty sure it does here. Uh, Ten thousand times the speed of light. And that's that's pretty quick for all of, for all of you playing along on the home version of the game. Yeah, um, yeah, ten thousand times the speed of light is rather rapid. And I think, and it was actually, I, I think, in the paper, and I'd have to look. I think it was actually greater than ten thousand times the speed of light. So you know, you can look at that and say, yeah, that's kind of quick. You know, you you shouldn't be able to materially move anything like that. So it's obvious that some things are just free of the connection. And, and part of that is, you know, in Einstein, I, I think it was probably very difficult for him to try and believe in something that you can't really reconcile with numbers. I mean, hats off to him and kudos for 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 uh, acquiescing to the idea that some things are just beyond beyond what you can discern and, and drill down on with numbers, uh, because it, I just don't think it's possible. I mean, we are effectively locked in the confines of this reality and it's hard to get out of that yeah so i mean yeah i totally agree i mean and then so philip so here's the idea right energy or quantum energy in our definition is is like a is like somewhat of a conscious slash life force energy uh, that brings forth life and consciousness right i mean i think we can all agree on that one and then the the, the attributes of this energy is that it is independent of space and time and so that then brings forth this idea here of quantum entanglement which has been proven in a scientific academic world so could you touch on the idea of this idea you know of the energy being free of space and time uh in in the clairvoyant world uh especially like with the way that you know some of your devices are working now where you could literally uh, use a device, right? Or use, or, in, or actually, someone like Roman. I mean, Roman did something really wild in a webinar I was in a few months ago with the EMF thing, you know, where he basically put a frequency onto a piece of a metal in my hands, uh, you know, five thousand miles away. It was just amazing. But you know, that whole idea of space and time not being relevant, but the ability to to move that energy uh, anywhere, anytime. So, I mean, in your world, I mean, well, how would, you know, I mean, what do you see, I mean, as, as, as this happening and, and what are your thoughts on that? Yes, absolutely. I, I definitely must agree with that from multiple angles, because first of all, through just energy work that Roman does or that 
crew or I do, it indeed doesn't matter at all whether someone <clears throat> sits in Europe right now and the other person is in South America. A, a distance does not matter and we can see instant changes, instant effects. And that is also what, what happened there with, with, with that card. Now, it also happens with the quantum block and the infinity block, for example, because that is not just a, a quantum energy field. It's an actual multidimensional quantum energy space. And there's, there's quite a difference in that because you can charge an object with quantum energy and then it tr transmits that. But it's, it's just solely a, a quantum energy field. There's no... Mm, it, it has a whole lot less intelligence or conscious quantum consciousness levels. So it's a, that's a very hard topic to discuss scientifically, but that's the way it is. And I'm sure we'll at some point arrive, maybe in the year when we talk about that, we can also expand on that. But if I put a picture in the quantum block or in the infinity block of someone that's 10,000 miles away, it, it has a measurable effect on the bio um, system of that person. And it doesn't matter if that person is just a mile away here um, as a neighbor or five or 10,000 miles away. There's zero difference in that regard. Mm, time is something, it's a little bit harder to explain and wrap our minds around I think in, in this standpoint, and I don't even know how to explain that well, but I can share um, something that I've, I've just heard about a week ago uh, from a customer actually, and she has a daughter that has, since her very young age as a little child, has been in, in quite deep depression. Uh, already as a pretty young girl, uh, she was sometimes for for a whole year would just always just go back in her room and just cry like for hours it's like almost unimaginable anyway so then you know there's nothing that they could ever do and that, that mother is actually also an alternative health practitioner so they tried lots of different things but they had to end up really with with harder medication and all of that just because yeah that that was the only way that would just help that um, daughter and that daughter is now I don't know you know in, in the 40s and nothing ever helped then that mother started to had that impulse and and, and I actually wanted to react to that because I had said you know that he wouldn't be surprised if thoughts um, are not coming from the brain I, I would say and actually differentiate because yeah we we can have thoughts in our brain but you know where we get our impulses from, our ideas, our, you know, all of that, that which is way broader than just a, like a specific thought. Like I'm going to think about how I'm going to cut that lemon. That is brain work for me. But if I get a real impulse on, on, on something that's so much deeper, that's coming from a completely different level. Anyway, going to that uh, woman, that mother, she had that impulse to actually when when that her girl started to have all these issues that was at a very, very young age, she thought, okay, so what if I take pictures of uh, my daughter from that time um, where all this started to happen and, and occur, right? Because there were instances that, you know, you know, started to, to occur and then she reacted in a very depressive way. So she took those pictures and put those into the infinity block. Um, not all together. She started to work with the youngest, basically, and then noticed already after weak differences. Her daughter did not know that she was doing that. And her daughter, they, they live in on different continents, actually. And and then she moved on to the next. Like I don't know, I don't know the details, but maybe uh, it was a picture of that girl how she was two or three months older. And so she worked her way through that, and it's just, things happen that has have never happened in that girl's life before. Things have healed that have never been healed before, and it, she's like a completely different person in a positive way, connected to herself. A um, lot of different issues and and 
behavior issues, um, depressive um, um, behavior and all that have, have changed in a, in a really, really dramatic and significant way. So I don't know. I think this is a great example of what's possible. I don't really know how that relates to time because it's still the, from my perspective, that healing still happened today, but it's, it, it, it's, it's taking like an energy of something that happened maybe 35, 38, 40 years ago, and it's fixing that. Um, so yeah, I just felt like sharing this story because I was so touched by it. And I, I feel it explains a little bit of this concept. Oh, that's an amazing, you know, yeah. you know, that kind of ties to, um, uh, uh, you know, EFT or German New Medicine and even uh, Tenet, where they talk, all of these guys talk about how emotion and trauma gets uh, gets trapped in the body. Uh, the, science, the science guys think it gets trapped in magnetic fields. Uh, the, uh, you know, the acupuncture folks are, you know, it gets trapped in your, uh, your energy fields and so forth. But the concept of that emotion and all that baggage we carry with us all through our lives are trapped and they actually cause physical maladies. That's German new medicine, right? And if you treat the emotion, you release you release the problem and then you can finally heal the problem. So I think that's probably what's going on is that the healing and the wellness of the life force source energy that's coming from this block, right? Is that it's actually going to her in this time, but then releasing that trauma that's that she's holding on to from the past right because it's it's directly tied to that because of the picture uh and then of course then allows her to heal it so that's my theory I mean, what do you, I mean, you get i mean i yes. would you or philip you guys think that's is that no, close i actually have you ever seen the uh, the research on the patients with sepsis uh, they, they had over three thousand patients with sepsis in a hospital a university hospital and they they separated them into two groups and uh one group was prayed you know they, they separated the files and then they prayed uh, on one group and they found that there was a statistical a very definitive and clear statistical correlation with benefits coming to the group that had received the the prayer um which you know as a scientist it sounds not so much to me because i've looked at this a lot but at the outset it would sound a little peculiar but the thing that really was difficult for me to wrap my brain around um was that you know the the effects of their you know intercessory prayer were all retroactive they did this on patients that had had uh their sepsis uh, i think a decade earlier um you know and and that's that's kind of interesting because they got a very clear statistical analysis and and it 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 showed very clearly that there was an effect but it was an effect that was devoid of temporality it wasn't contingent on linear time and that's uh it is as just as a person who's trapped in linear time it's very difficult to break the construct and say oh i can do something today and affect an outcome tomorrow because it, it seems to deviate from the concept of causality um which the more and more i i get into things the more and more i begin to think that the concept of causality is just that it's a concept it's some sort of method that we use to try and define and determine reality and place meaning around something in such a way that we can interpret what's going on because we're not actually capable of interpreting the totality of the experience that that really from my experience really looks like something that lacks causality there is no cause and effect uh, i think it actually is more just uh the timeline is moving in both directions simultaneously in the experience for all i know uh, may already have been completely wrapped, which is sort of a Calvinist approach to it, you know, saying that the predestination of things, I, I assume. But um, it kind of has, when you see statistical data like that, that's very clear, yielding an effect previously, it, it reminds me of what you were talking about, Philip. I, I just, I know that those things are possible. Um, I don't exactly understand how they work yet. Uh, hopefully at some point I will. Um, but it, it definitely, you have to look at it with an open mind and say, it is an effect that's happening. I don't understand how, so I'm going to try. And, you know, hopefully that's, I think that's what you're kind of driving at, Kay, is a lot of this stuff 
we're just not there yet. You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the whole point of the, the you know of this of this chat and of this tinker chat is is to discuss the science of quantum and to really explain that we you know yeah we're just not there yet we don't have a vernacular for it um, and we're only seeing now what it is uh, you know we have flavors right and we have we know what it's not but we're seeing what it is through what it does and that's kind of my my last uh, points that I wanted to kind of just bounce off you guys. I mean, we've only got about, eh, we got 10 more minutes before Philip's got to go. Uh, and I know you got to go too, Ian. So if we could, we could just kind of chat for the last 10 minutes just to talk about, okay, well, if we can't define exactly what it is, because we don't have words, we know what it's not, we know what it's kind of like, we know that it's independent of space and time. So then the next thing we want to say is, well, well then what is, um, what is the application of a daily life? Like, what does it do? And so, Philip, great story. You just shared that. I kind of, you know, have some bullets here where I just would like to just bounce off you. I just get your, you know, your feedback on on what you can do with it or what, you know, what does it do in your daily life? And then the methods of we, if we can get to that. But really, for me, I think like what you were just talking about, Philip, was the concept of of its ability to heal and not just heal physical. Right. Uh, but healing and then wellness, right, to bring someone into wellness. And then like in my background, bioelectrical magnetics, I mean, just to, as a quote for like Georges Lakovsky created a multi-wave oscillator. And the whole uh, the whole purpose of the oscillator was to bring in tune your biofield and your whole biology into its optimum resonance. Right. And that and by, by lifting you into that optimal resonance, you become the optimal physical being you know, of, of who you are, you're the op, you know, and, and so then of course you were healed if you had a problem. And so this whole idea of wellness is all about bringing you up to your perfect state. And of course, we know that there's an effect on mood and emotions, also cognitive function, but then also too, I want to touch on, and I think this would be a good one for, uh, Ian, you know, the scientist, but <laughs> you want to be shaman for a second, but also the use of quantum energy for the concept of enlightenment. So, gentlemen, I mean, what, what are your thoughts along the idea of, you know, so we define this by what it can do. And so what do you what do you guys yes. think? I would and like to define? jump in. Yes, please. Yeah. So so the what what's what I always tell people if they ask me, okay, this energy that's in the quantum block and then in the infinity block, what, what does it do? And in an essence. It, because it is multidimensional and it, there's there's consciousness levels in there, significant consciousness levels, quantum consciousness levels, um, it actually supports and underlines everything that is life-giving consciousness and life-supporting, and it neutralizes everything that is harmful to consciousness and harmful to the physical body, whether that's human, plant, animal, doesn't matter. Um, and in essence, what what it what it does is it invites you into your own completeness and supports you with that. What does healing really mean? It becomes it means to to become whole or to to be whole. If I'm heal, I'm whole. Um, and that has multiple aspects. Obviously, it's and and if if you have an energy that can support you on that path then you can understand okay why why does that now also uh, help with this histamine response right that that suddenly doesn't have histamine response anymore um just because it's neutralizing something that is harmful for that particular um person that is hard to understand those are just two three sentences but once one grasps what that really means they understand what it what it does it also doesn't you, because everybody is so different everybody is at a different state of consciousness in a different state with her physical body and has different you know a different soul plan different things to take care of and to learn and to experience right that's why that's actually the only reason, the main reason why it, it doesn't work the very same way for everybody all the time. 
even though you can replicate this one example, for example, that I gave over and over again, and yes, you have all these improvements you can see in the blood and all of that, but the exact effect um, of something may be different from K to I and to myself, um, and it always helps us there where we are, and then helps us to uh, take a step further. That's that's how I can explain it, and that's how I see it relate to all these points that that you listed here on this on this slide. Yeah, I mean we're all different TVs, right? So we're all going to experience it different. Uh, but so, what do you think in terms of like using um, quantum energy for enlightenment? I mean, do you think that's possible? Or could that be the next step? Because we know it really helps wellness and healing. Uh, of course, the emotional states, moods. Uh, but then I'm thinking, you know, what about cognitive function? Um, and then also as well as enlightenment. But more and so enlightenment, because it seems like uh, that seems to be the one missing component in a lot of people's lives. Well, it just, yeah. okay, objectively, yeah. how, are, how are you describing the enlightenment? Because that, that too is one of those things that's a, oh, a little outside of the norm. So what would you say for the purpose of, you know, people who aren't, you know, uh, spiritual oh, aspirants, who, who aren't hell bent on enlightenment. Um, what do you think that is? I mean, how do you describe that? Oh, good question. You're right. You're right. I should have said, uh, yeah. Uh, in my definition, enlightenment is the raising your vibration. Um, and, and once you raise your vibration, become uh, you become more like acutely aware. Your senses become stronger. You can feel everything around you. you your thinking is more neutral. You're not, you're not reactive. It's kind of like you're able to distance yourself between stimulus and response. All of those things, you become an enlightened being by just chilling out and being able to just sense everything around you and being much more in control of yourself. And then being a higher vibratory uh, being, you're able to kind of just expand your consciousness to understand more. And you just become more of a, uh, a just, you know, I mean, peaceful, uh, wiser, gentler human, I guess is my best phrase. Not, I'm not talking Nirvana now. I'm just talking about, you know, being here on earth. Wow. Well said. Um, okay. So are you familiar with, um, David Hawkins power versus force? No, I haven't heard that one. Um, it's a really good book. Uh, Hawkins was an MD PhD and very brilliant guy. Um, and he spent most of his career as a psychologist and, uh, or psychiatrist, I suppose. Um, but his, his real crux of his work was defining the, his map of consciousness was kind of his seminal work. And he goes through and expresses different gradients of where people are. And he actually had a logarithmic scale that he put together to kind of gauge uh, people. And it, it's really, it's a great read, especially for somebody like me who likes uh, really clinical sorts of things where I can, I can wrap my head around it. And, and he did all of the statistical analysis of the whole thing. And it was actually his book, uh, Power Versus Force, was actually kind of the culmination of his doctoral thesis. And it's really brilliant. I would recommend anybody read it. But on that, he has, and the reason it comes to mind is he has a, a breaking point where people hit enlightenment. And it was at, on his scale, if memory serves, that the uh, consciousness level was 600, I believe. Um, but when I read the book, I remember thinking, ah, I know people at this point, and I know people at this point. And it was interesting from the standpoint of a psychiatrist, how he broke it down with, at this level of evolution, this will be your experience. And at this level of evolution, and what you just said when you were explaining this really resonated with me, Kay, because the idea that you become more capable of desensitizing yourself to the negativity in your environment um, while becoming more of a positive uh, positive source of motivation for those around you and also um, mentally you become a stronger reference point where you're cognitively capable of doing things that other people perceive to be almost impossible um, and, and I, I do remember one thing jumps out on in his book was in his discussion about uh, I think it was Einstein uh, since we were just talking about him had capped out at the the top end of human intellectual capacity, but wasn't able to go beyond that 
uh, because of his lack of acceptance of the concept that there was something far greater and more uh, and and inherently divine in that, which which I you know not really saying that that is or is not the case. I'm just saying it, it's kind of intriguing, but I I would recommend everybody take a look at that because for me everything you listed here you know your healing and wellness I know from decades of meditation that the more you do that the more you're capable of getting your body in tune uh, the more uh, capable you are of taking things that would normally be a sympathetic nervous system response and putting them into a parasympathetic state uh, I just did this uh, last week with a a, a, a thing called Sananga, which is kind of effectively like putting a capsaicin, you know, pepper spray in your eyes for the purpose of um, kind of retuning your ocular function. Uh, and, it, and it works very well. There's a lot of clinical data on it. Uh, the problem is it's excruciating because you yeah. have effectively pepper sprayed yourself, uh, you yeah. know, which is the least, <laughs> the least likely, the, the least popular flavor of breath spray, you know, pepper spray. Um, you know, um, it's, it was interesting because um, you really do get to gauge a sense of how much in control of your own physiology you are when you have somebody pop a bunch of pepper spray in your eyes. You know, if yeah. you're completely able to take care of your body and not allow it to go completely wackadoo crazy and your muscles tense and your respiration go off the charts. That to me would kind of be a, oh, a marker of the idea that you're progressing uh, in terms of your own evolution because, you know, the physiology is no longer the governing factor. It's more your consciousness expressing itself through your physiology. Um, now, when you get on to the point of enlightenment through through tools, and, and Philip, I'm incredibly curious to hear your take on this. Using something like uh, one of the blocks to enhance your own consciousness, I would say from my personal perception, that does seem to be the case. Uh, but to take you all the way to an, you know, the state that would normally be termed enlightenment, or you know, having probably read too much, you know, like samadhi or nervi kalpa samadhi or one of those states. Yeah. Um, I don't know that that's actually something that you would do by, you know, putting a quantum block on your head and wearing it as a hat for many, many months. Um, I think it's actually a process that is kind of an unfolding of your own consciousness that's going to happen through time. Yes, it. that's exactly right. It's a process. It's much less um, something that just happens to us like tomorrow, you know, suddenly all, you hear these stories of, okay, that person just you know, cross the road and suddenly was enlightened, you know, that's really not the majority. Usually it's, it's really a process and yeah, the quantum and the infinity block absolutely uh, support and help with that. So my analogy is always, I know we're running uh, hard on time here, but my analogy is like, we're all working, walking on a dirt road uh, or you know, having a bicycle, like an old bicycle and we're riding on this dirt uh, road and that is, our life right that's how we progress we're you know we're having these goals and we meet different people on the way and all of that and then suddenly there's someone about 50 yards to the right and is is saying hey you know just why don't you come over here you know there's an autobahn built here um and and i got a new lamborghini why don't you just you know get in and and just keep going here and it's it's parallel to the dirt road right and so you walk over uh, you get into this new Lamborghini and you're suddenly driving on that Autobahn and you're super fast, you're getting everywhere way quicker. And uh, that still doesn't mean that you may not have a flat tire every now and then and all of that, but you get there quicker. And that's exactly the same here. You know, the, the, the unlocking of our consciousness is just happening way faster and way easier. It supports us. It, it does not at all mean it's going to happen tomorrow. If you were in your head for a day, that actually may not be a good idea to do that. Um, so it is really something that under that supports us on our path towards that. Yeah, my two cents, honestly, is that uh, being around these energy devices and then also wearing one a capsule all the time. Uh, I have noticed over the last six months that I've been playing around with all of these Layla Q devices, I have distinctly found myself uh, changing uh, in, in, on every one of these levels right here. 
Um, and I can't attribute it to anything other than that because my diet, everything's the same. So that's, that's just my two cents. And I can talk more about that later. I know we're out of time. So guys, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great conversation as always. I love, I'm loving this, right? Uh, and I just want to say to everybody out there, uh, if you want to find Ian, uh, he's now at wizardsciences.com. He's got his website up and running and his new product out, out for sale. Uh, you've got Philip at Layla uh, Quantum Tech, and that's at laylaq.com. And you can find me at the Tinkers Academy, uh, tinkers.academy in your all window. And that's how you'll find us. Uh, I will put links to where you can find us in the video description. Um, and welcome all of the comments. And, of course, join us on Telegram, and we can chat more about this topic. And then uh, probably we'll have another video down the road and we'll, we'll carry it forward. So, gentlemen, uh, any parting words and, and mahalo? Well, I, I'm going to have to go hey. back and adjust my day planner because I had uh, full enlightenment scheduled for Saturday at 3 in the afternoon. So <laughs> <laughs> apparently uh, if it doesn't work that way. I'm going to have to adjust. But that, that leaves it open for me to go have some dip and dots. So I'll do that instead. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you're awesome Ian. no well, uh, thank I, you yeah thanks Kay. yeah appreciate it as always thank you and yeah, it was a great conversation thank you Ian. thank you Kay. and i have maybe just something for for the audience we sort of the way we live our lives and what's presented to us certainly it's difficult anyway to progress in this you know path to enlightenment right <laughs> but one thing is is also something that we've been trained to in a way, and that's we're looking for the big things, for the huge impacts, for the enlightenment to tomorrow at three p.m. Right? But exactly, we can <laughs> tune our senses, retune our senses to the little things. What are the little things? And life is so much about the little things. And if we start paying more attention to the little things we'll suddenly notice also more miracles. And it really isn't always about this big thing. Let's, let's uh, yeah, try to find the little things, the little miracles in our lives. And we'll notice a lot more suddenly about how we're all progressing. Wow, really well said. Uh, my, last well said words, my, my last parting words, guys, is one of the things that I, I brought that, I put that on the slide was, was because of the concept of decalcifying my pineal gland or opening up my third eye by sticking my head in a Q block, right? Uh, and I'm 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 experimenting with that, <laughs> uh, you know, and seeing how it affects my dreams and so forth. So I'm growing my uh, infinity blocks to a very high number, uh, just for that purpose to see what happens. So we'll uh, let you know what goes on. <laughs> but thank you so much. <laughs> yes, I'm at, very yeah. curious to see how that works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because think about it, right? I mean, that's one way to enlightenment is your pineal gland. So there you go. So hey, thanks guys. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the recording now and and mahalo everybody for uh, for watching and spending some time with us. And and hey, thanks a lot and have a great day. All right, have a great weekend, guys. Okay.